Good morning, folks. We just signed a purchase order for an Okuma MB4000H horizontal CNC machine. If you had asked me a few months ago if this was on our radar going to happen, I wouldn't have had the same conviction, but a lot has kind of changed over the past few months, and I want to walk through what we bought, why we bought it, uh, and talk at first more about the CNC machine aspects of this purchase, but then at the end, stick around, I want to kind of talk about more of the business side of it and why we need this more at that point. The goal of this video, hopefully, is to help you guys, if you're at that point, to see uh, what kind of spindles you should buy, what kind of automation you should buy, the capabilities, because this thing is pretty cool. Quick correction, when I was re-watching this video footage for the first edit, I realized it makes it sound like this idea came out of nowhere, and that's, uh, I didn't use my words very wisely there. We've been thinking about this for well over a year. What I realized in the last few months was we really need the machine now, and the initial lead times of six, seven months to get the machine here and then installed and then up and running makes made me realize we've got to act on this now. So we bought an MB4000H. It is a 400 millimeter machine. If you start researching uh, horizontals, that's usually the nomenclature, 400 millimeter, 500 millimeter, 600 millimeter. Uh, and that refers to the diameter of the pallet base that the tombstone is going to live on. And it's not that it's an irrelevant way of sizing them, but it's a little bit misleading because uh, a 400 millimeter machine is not the same across various different manufacturers. Generally speaking, 400 millimeter machines have somewhere around 20 to 22 inches of Y and X travel, which frankly isn't a lot. Um, on a horizontal, your spindle is parallel to the ground. You have the benefit of, of less gravity uh, helping evacuate chips and coolant and so forth. And you also have an inherent fourth axis in the form of the B platter. What you also really gain is additional stiffness and rigidity because you've got the base of the machine and then you've got the vertical column that hosts the spindle, but uh, you don't have what you have in a C-frame, which is that additional third beam across the top that hosts your spindle this way, which if you run C-axis machines or your traditional vertical machining center, that will often manifest itself in some relatively minor but nevertheless measurable amount of head knot or tram error or so forth. Uh, horizontal just gets rid of one of those three you know, kinematic elements, if you will. But the y-axis is really the key because that's the distance the machine spindle can travel kind of from the bottom to the top, up and down vertically. It actually makes a lot of sense, even though it's a weird transition if you've only run vertical machining centers. If you think about what the view would be from the spindle, you realize x is left to right, just like it is on a vertical. Z is in and out, kind of walking along the floor, if you will. 22 inches of y isn't a lot for us, especially if you start thinking about the fact that you'll need to have lead in and lead outs on tool paths with face mills that may have a one to two inch diameter. You can start to eat up space really quick. And the other kind of quirky thing about horizontals is understanding the access uh, to the bottom area of the tombstone. We actually brought this up on the Area 419 tour when John was talking about how they actually have to prep some of their tombstones on a vertical machine because their uh, NHX doesn't have the right way of reaching the low point that they'd want to reach. So we were debating that. We were considering a 500 millimeter machine. Uh, generally speaking, you jump from about 22 inches up to closer to 30 inches. Um, so not only is it eight inches more, but what's crazy is if you think about how much dead space you're gonna to have to have from those lead in and lead out tool paths and fixturing. Uh, it might be the case where you could go from say three parts in Y to five parts. So you're almost doubling uh, your part capacity. I spent a lot of time thinking about this and ultimately what I realized I need to do was stop pondering and putting some data down in hard numbers. So that's what we did. We made a list of the products that we wanted to make on it. We downloaded uh, Tombstone City tombstone model. So they have two-sided, four-sided, six-sided, and eight-sided. And in a really crude sense, just started laying out strips of parts. I wanted to see, could we get a 400 millimeter machine to run for 12 hours, 24 hours? Um, and we didn't have a specific goal. I, this isn't, I'd like to think we're not the traditional horizontal shop where I want this workhorse of a machine that's just going to crank out thousands or tens of thousands of parts. What we needed was a solution to a problem that we've had for the past three months, which is we just can't keep up. And if you run a shop, I'm guessing you know what this is like. We just need more spindles. And as we all know, it takes time to swap between products and so forth. Now we've gotten pretty good at using our fixture plates and our quick chain pallets to switch between things as we need, but a horizontal takes that to a whole nother level. 
because we've got six tombstones in the machine. At any point in time, if we need more of a specific product through the pallet management software, we can just reprioritize that pallet and we can immediately start running more of our Saunders pallets, more of our reversible inserts, more of our top jaws. And the machine is well suited with the uh, chip management system and the tool changer to complete that full run regardless of whether we're here at the shop or not. Um, so it's really a phenomenal form of automation. It's our first real step of detaching spindle hours from work hours, meaning we for sure will not have to be here uh, and this machine will be able to run. Now I'll talk more at the end of the video about this, but we don't actually want to overproduce. I don't want to have this thing cranking. You know, my goal is not to get thousands of hours, spindle hours per year just for the sake of a metric. Uh, it's to be able to produce what we need when we need it with the minimal amount of effort on our part of retooling, refixturing, uh, et cetera. The other complicating factor between deciding which machine to buy, uh, or which brand to buy, which model, is there's not really a common thread between builders, manufacturers, and sizes. They, different machines have different built-in capabilities for how big a tool changer you can get before you have to step up to a external tool changing matrix. Uh, some have different size APCs, a traditional horizontal almost always comes with two pallets, so they always do a rotisserie swap or a lazy susan swap. Um, I don't think I know of any horizontals that don't have that. So you at least have two tombstones. But for us, uh, I wasn't interested in a machine that didn't have some version of automation. In this case, we went with the six pallet APC. Uh, we had looked initially at the 10 pallet. It actually wasn't that much more money, um, but for us, it would have meant a special order from Japan. And ultimately what this came down to was realizing we need this machine now. If we wait any longer, it will be for sure too long. The machine also came with either 40 or 64. Maybe there was a 100 option, but it wasn't available in stock in the U.S. Tool changer capacity before you stepped up to the matrix. And uh, to take a, l a little detour, uh, when I was really trying to think about what the plan makes sense long term, I realized, so it's crazy to say, uh, that two horizontals actually makes sense, uh, keeping them material specific. And I do actually think there's a chance that we grow into that. Absolutely not in the cards for now, but I will never forget the make mistake I kind of made buying our first Haas machine, which is... I thought it was going to be our only machine ever. It was just such a crazy step up for us at the time. I mean, good grief. We started with a tag in our New York City apartment. Getting Going to Tormox and then Haas was crazy. But I over-optioned that machine. It was a great machine. The capabilities were awesome. But I shouldn't have spent some of the money I spent knowing that I was going to buy the second one sooner than I thought at the time. So uh, what I did some thinking on this horizontal was, well, what if we could get by with like 64 tools in the uh, built-in changer and avoid the cost of the extra tool matrix. Uh, and that could have worked, but ultimately when I thought about how we really want to run this machine, it made sense to get the tool matrix because of how we're gonna tool it up, have multiple products on it, sister tools, process reliability, and so forth. Now what we might consider doing if we are able to grow into a second one down the road, the second one, if it only ran aluminum, because aluminum is so much more forgiving on tool and tool life, I suspect that one would be able to uh, keep just the built-in tool changer uh, and not go for the extra. It's not only the cost of the <laughs> matrix from the machine builder, it's extra rigging money, freight money, it's extra, obviously, investment in tool holders and so forth. There aren't a ton of other options when it comes to how we optioned out the machine. Uh, we purchased Okuma's collision avoidance software. I need to learn a lot more about that, but my understanding is that will allow us to work between the Fusion CAD and CAM models and the Akuma control to make sure we don't have uh, crashes. I want to give a big shout out to Chris over uh, at Ignite Digi. We'll throw in a, a link to his Instagram here, but Chris is a super nice guy. We've had a few good conversations over the years. He has this almost exact machine uh, and has done an absolute tremendous job of, of sharing and building resources around it for their shop. Uh, and he unfortunately has had a couple of goofs and it absolutely makes sense for us to have that collision avoidance software. We have a tool break detection uh, table type probe, which can measure gauge length, but it cannot measure tool diameter. I believe I'm okay with that. We also have the Speroni if we wanna do more detailed offline tool measurement. Uh, we have the spindle probe. We got the same Mayfran Concept 2000 uh, chip conveyor, which has been awesome so far and the same MP systems uh, through spindle coolant system and mist collector. And then the only other thing we had to add, we'll go into more detail in a future video on this, but was the 
Okuma, I think it's called the Frickster tracking option, but we needed to make sure we had the ability to probe and set coordinate systems anywhere we wanted along a tombstone on any side and not just program off, say, center line. I'm not 100% sure I'm articulating that point correctly. And frankly, there was some confusion in the sales process around that. I believe this used to be called the call 088 functionality, but I knew that was an important feature uh, we needed. It was also a software feature, so it wasn't something that had to be factory ordered if we did somehow goof on it. We've already started thinking about tombstone designs. I've been going through old factory tour videos and photos that I have online or photos that you find online and looking through how folks have tooled these up. Metal Quest is a great example that comes to mind. They run, I think, nine <laughs> Okuma horizontals. Uh, Area 419, again, was a recent tour we just did. Tombstone City seems like a great resource where they have different sized uh, tombstones. Cab models, easy to download. We found Abbott tooling, which makes aluminum tombstones, but my first go-to is probably going to be kind of that mantra of fail fast, fail cheap. Um, this whole process is such a different, you know, tombstones are so different and foreign to us. We've talked to enough people who know you can build your own. I'm not saying that makes the most sense long term, but what I think we can probably do is just take a piece of six or eight inch aluminum round bar, uh, fasten it to a pallet base, and then deck that into say four or six sides uh, and get that to be the foundation of a tombstone. Because here's the irony about a tombstone. I don't actually care about the face of the tombstone itself. For example, let's say we do start buying the cast iron style from a, like a tombstone city. We're not gonna machine fixtures directly into that. We're gonna mount an aluminum or a steel, either semi-sacrificial or semi-permanent fixture base or plate onto it to do our stuff on it for, for obvious reasons of longevity, changing things over. It may be kind of screwed in there. It might be quick couplered in there. We're going to start digesting it slowly that way. We need to at least get one or two ready so that when the machine comes, we'll be able to start testing out and making chips. Another quick timeout. I actually do think there's a decent chance we make our own tombstone at some point but having slept on it now for a few nights and modeled up a bunch of tombstones, we realized not the right way to go when we get started. And we actually already have a six-sided tombstone, a four-sided tombstone, and they call this one the T-style, but um, it's traditionally two-sided. I actually think we have some creative ways of using all four sides of it. Um, but that's what's really amazing about this. When we started doing the math, take a product like our reversible inserts. We run those four at a time right now. The tombstone density should be easily somewhere between 30 and 72 per tombstone. Um, now that's a favorable part because it's quite small. We won't get the same kind of gains with our mod vice bases or the top jaws from the mod vices, but nevertheless, it just goes to show what the absolute throughput capability is of these machines. Uh, and everyone that we've talked to who has purchased and gone from verticals to horizontal has said, it's just unbelievable the productivity gains you will realize. I'm not 100% sure uh, where it's gonna go in the shop, but we want to plan on not ever moving it uh, because it's a big heavy machine and it's effectively three separate machines, the APC, the matrix, and then the actual horizontal machine. So to move it, I think is gonna be a lot more complicated than a vertical machine, which we can actually move even our big 20,000 pound verticals. We have skates, uh, we can lift them up, move them around, re-level them. This has to get bolted to the floor because the machine is so fast. It's got like 2,300 inch rapids or something. All three of those components have to be bolted down and aligned relative to each other. So I don't wanna move this thing if I don't have to. So what we wanna do is think about putting it somewhere where regardless of what we add or move later on, it's not gonna disrupt this horizontal. It's been great to have the 3D printed layout of our shops so that we can put it in a few different spots and see what it feels like from a flow standpoint. Uh, so more to come on where it goes. But speaking of sort of digital twins like that, the fusion simulation is absolutely awesome. Uh, they actually already had this machine in uh, fusion is by default so be able to dump in a tombstone put a product on it and already start to look at what that machine simulation really looks like so uh, i've got a lot more to learn on that but super excited to see just exactly what that whole workflow looks like knock on wood we should be able to move a lot of our cam over which will save us a lot of the transition time uh, especially at first uh, just to get it up and running so to wrap up like i mentioned in the beginning sort of the business roi side of this what I realized, you know, we have these Friday meetings and for a long time, uh, we've had this recurring theme of how do we kind of get to that next step, get ahead. Uh, not in a bad way, but we'll have spikes in sales or we'll have um, product demand that we thought we could predict and it just changes a little bit. And we're really good at doing what we do when we are able to ship orders 
with products on hand and inventory. It is so much more difficult when somebody orders something uh, where, you know, let's say they would order 10 things or 20 things and one or two of those is not in stock. The complications that it creates are, are unbelievable, not something I really realized because we want to pull the rest of that order so that we don't accidentally sell out of what they had already ordered. Uh, but then you've got to set that order aside. You've got to have more time packing it, checking it, rechecking it. You've got to push and force into the order queue or, or the production queue something that they're missing. You want to deliver to customers quickly on time the story goes on. And so we thought about, okay, how do we tackle this? Also in light of the theme everybody has heard about, which is the whole skilled labor debate of what do we need to do to be able to grow our business intelligently and smartly recognizing uh, limitations about the workforce and so forth. And what we realized is this machine will be absolutely incredible because it's going to be able to be so productive and that's going to let us use the people we have and the machines that we already have, the verticals, to do more of what I want to do, which is continue to iterate, continue to learn, continue to train. Uh, in fact, I think, knock on wood, we're going to be able to reopen our training classes again. We had to shut them down since COVID. Uh, and one of our Haas machines will probably be moving over to dedicate toward that, which I am super excited about. Um, but also just from a productivity standpoint, if we get an order for something and we don't have it, the horizontal is as close to a push button, get that part made because the fixed stream will be there. We'll probably leave material in those tombstones. So, uh, if we need something, you hit a button, the tools are in there, the sister tools are in there, uh, and we can get stuff made with no stress very quickly, but we don't want to overproduce. We will not be using this machine to just crank out hundreds or thousands of extra parts to have them on the shelves, uh, at all. That's not the goal. Uh, where we will be able to help is the way we fix your stuff and build stuff, we can start buying strips instead of saw cut to individual length pieces. So that's gonna save us some money on uh, the number of saw cuts that we have to buy from our supplier, as well as just, it's a little bit easier to load a 20 inch strip in than four, four inch strips, if you will. Um, but that comes back to also then using probing and intelligent fixturing to make sure when we load that in, it's all in the correct place. So. Uh, I'm pretty fired up about integrating this thing. It's it's a lot uh, it's a lot to bite off, but but that hasn't stopped us in the past. And ultimately, it it ties into what I want Saunders to be, which is this place to work where we're investing in the equipment that we need to do what we need to produce excellent parts. To be proud of it, and um, I love the products that we make, but I equally, if not more, just love the idea of machining. It's just absolutely amazing to me. Um, I, I never really thought a horizontal was going to be part of our story. Uh, for a long time, I thought, could we do this whole thing with an automated five axis? Uh, and we thought long and hard about that. And then maybe there'll be one of those in our future if we can figure out a way to justify it. But the product lines that we need to run and the way we need to make them absolutely uh, make this make sense. So wanted to bring you guys along for that journey. More to come. Let us know what else you want to see and learn. Uh, there isn't a ton of horizontal content out there. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to be as open as we could sharing what we've learned, the struggles. Um, though actually one thing I forgot to mention in terms of picking between a 400 millimeter and a 500 millimeter is if you have big parts, there's no question you're gonna need to step up to that larger size. Um, yeah, but here we go. So as always folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.